Welcome to AP European History and IB History Year 1 review session number 3. This is France from the 1300s through 1914. By the 1300s, France had been engaged in a struggle with the English for really almost a couple hundred years. Uh, and it started when the the, the Duke of, of Normandy, William, conquered England. And, of course, at that point... Um, England essentially became part of Normandy, but, but in a lot of ways it was as though Normandy was part of England. And the English, in the centuries following that, used Normandy as a sort of base of operations to try to expand their territory into what was to become France. Um, they did this through conquest and through marriage. Uh, and so the French then were always trying to regain control of that territory and, and stop the English expansion. This is an expensive business. Uh, the business of waging almost constant state of war against the English was an expensive business. And um, on a, re a regular basis, French kings had found it necessary to take loans. And um, it's interesting that uh, they were always trying to figure out ways then to pay back these loans. And in the 1300s, Philippe IV, also known as Philippe le Bel, Philip the Fair, um, had essentially decided that the best way to try to pay off his loans was to tax an entity which up till that time had not been taxed, which was the, the church. And um, at that time, though, uh, Pope Boniface VIII rejected the idea that a secular authority could, could tax the church, and he, in fact... Um, excommunicated Philippe le Bel. And at that time, Philippe le Bel then assembled the military forces of France and waged war against the Pope. They actually invaded Italy and captured Boniface and imprisoned him. And although Boniface eventually escaped, he died shortly thereafter as a result of abuse and neglect at the hands of the French forces. At that time, then, the French in control of Italy um, summoned a, a, a college of bishops to... Um, to uh, elect a new pope, and uh, they essentially elected a French pope, and this was Pope Clement V. And this, he was the first of a series of popes who were part of what was known as the Avignon Papacy. Clement V moved the headquarters of the church from Rome to Avignon, which was close to France, and he was, in fact, a puppet of the French monarchy. Clement V was a puppet of the French monarchy. And for a period of, what, 68 years, roughly, a period known in Christendom as the Babylonian captivity, the, the hierarchy, the upper hierarchy, the, the papal court, uh, was controlled by the French king and, and operated out of Avignon. And um, it was during this time, too, that the papacy began to grow in its... Um, and the papal court began to grow in its, its worldliness and in its taste for luxury. The Avignon papacy, for many, is kind of the beginnings of the, of the degradation, uh, the, the downfall of the Roman Catholic Church as it rolled toward the Reformation. But it's going to be another you know, couple of hundred years before the Reformation began. But uh, nevertheless, the Avignon papacy was a period in which the church fell into disrepute, particularly as it, as it had come under the control of the French king. Now, eventually, the Avignon papacy ended, the, um, the, the papal court returned to Rome, and the pope began to operate more independently than he had uh, during those years. Uh, but back and forth, there was a lot of uh, d disquiet about, uh, about who the pope should be, and eventually, uh, the king of France, Charles VIII, sort of, as far as he was concerned, settled the issue by issuing what was known as the Pragmatic Sanction of Bourges. In 1438, he, he simply announced that essentially uh, France was now going to be separate from the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, that uh, the French people would continue to follow the Pope's direction on, on matters of spiritual doctrine, but as far as the hierarchy of the Church was concerned uh, in France, that hierarchy would be answerable to the king uh, and not to the Pope. So it was, a, it was an illustration of how, um, of how the church in its struggles was beginning to lose some of its grip on the, on the secular leaders, and particularly in France. It represented a sort of a successful power play by the French. Uh, in the intervening years, then, you have the Hundred Years' War. And the Hundred Years' War was a period of, of warfare, ongoing warfare, between the, the French and the English. 
uh, ostensibly over control of the wool trade in Flanders, but in reality it was about territory, and it was about what we said before, England trying to expand its territory and France trying to retake it. Hundred Years' War lasted from 1337 to 1453, and, um, you know, it featured a major turnaround because the English were doing very well at the beginning. Uh, they had some advantages in technology, the longbow. Uh, that uh, turning point then comes with the French national hero, the arrival of the French national hero, Joan of Arc, uh, who uh, claimed to have seen visions uh, or have heard voices of saints uh, telling her that it was her destiny to lead the French armies. And she had observed the suffering of French soldiers. She had seen cartloads of wounded French soldiers being carried back from the battlefields. And she was able to persuade the king of France to give her command of France's armies. And she fought uh, many battles and, and, and helped to turn the tide of the war. Now, in reality, uh, she was then captured and executed. But even in her execution, she proved to be an advantage for the French because... Um, because of the fact that when she was executed, when she was burned at the stake, she made no noise. She didn't cry out in pain, didn't cry out in agony, and, and many believed that God was protecting her. And even one English soldier was heard to say, we are doomed, for we have burned a saint. And uh, instead of reducing French morale, the French were ever more persuaded that, that, that God was on their side and that he would ultimately help them triumph over the English. In reality, it was the French invention of artillery that allowed them to win this war. The English were seeking to hold territory through the possession of castles, and uh, they garrisoned these castles, and, and English soldiers could sort of move out of these castles and, and control territory, and the French, with their new uh, artillery, were able to, to batter down the walls of these castles, and in the end, England lost all of its possessions, almost all of its possessions in France. Uh, however, um, the Hundred Years' War established France as a strong national state, a strong national monarchy, um, united, really fully united for the first time, but not for long, because then the, the, uh, the Reformation caused great um, chaos in France. Uh, there were a group of French who were followers of John Calvin, and these French were known as the Huguenots, H-U-G-U-E-N-O-T-S, uh, Huguenots. And uh, they were sort of trying to operate in an environment which was very strongly Roman Catholic. You know, despite the disagreements between uh, the church and the French monarchy back in the 1300s, by the 1500s, uh, relations between uh, the, the, the monarch and the, the, the Vatican at least allowed for a, a full-hearted belief in the ways, the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. And so the presence of uh, dissidents, which is what the Huguenots were, they were, they were dissidents, they were Calvinist dissidents against Roman Catholicism, uh, was intolerable to the monarchy. And uh, civil war raged back and forth. And it seemed that uh, in 1572 there might be a, a, an end to this civil war when Henri of Navarre, who was one of the leaders of the, the Huguenot cause, he was a leading Huguenot, when he agreed to, to marry the king's daughter, and it was thought that this would bring about peace. But there was a group of, of sort of radical uh, uh, Roman Catholics known as the Guise, the family, the Duke of Guise, G-U-I-S-E, and he plotted, he, recognizing that... Uh, recognizing that all of the leading Huguenots would be coming together in one place for this marriage, he plotted to slaughter them, to massacre them, and uh, perhaps um, finally once and for all put an end to Huguenotism. This was known as the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, and in 1572 it took place. Um, the king of France was ultimately brought in on this plot and, and agreed to it, and um, Henri himself barely escaped, and it simply reignited uh, the fighting again, and uh, the fighting went on really for another uh, 15, 17 years. Uh, the, it's an ongoing civil war between the Roman Catholics and the Huguenots. The Huguenots had an advantage in that they at least were um, they at least were politically united around their cause. Uh, the Roman Catholic uh, side in the war broke into multiple factions because there was a growing dispute over. Uh, who the rightful king of France should be, and various um, various Roman Catholic uh, families uh, saw themselves as the natural heirs, and as a result, the, the Roman Catholics were not united in their war against the Huguenots, and so the Huguenots, although 
um, although minorities, uh, succeeded in actually winning the war. And in 1589, Henri of Navarre was, um, was crowned the king of France. Um, Henri IV, king of France. And, and he, in the long run, was known as the good king Henri, or le grand roi, the good king, great king Henri, uh, because he was able in his 21 years on the throne to bring order out of chaos and bring peace out of bloodshed and bring prosperity out of poverty because the, the ongoing chaos in France had brought their economy to a halt and had really prevented them from entering into this sort of new modern economy that was led by you know, merchants and, and, and bankers and that sort of thing that was emerging in other places like the Netherlands and Britain. Um, Henri was a, a pragmatist. Uh, although a, a, uh, a Huguenot himself and an avowed Huguenot who had, who had fought for the Huguenot cause, uh, upon his coronation, he actually converted to Roman Catholicism. He understood that, that defeating the Roman Catholic armies was, was one thing, but ruling over a Roman Catholic majority who perhaps didn't want to be ruled by him would be another problem. And so in converting to Roman Catholicism, he, he felt that he, could, um, that he could manage his people better. And he also married a, a Roman Catholic uh, woman, Marie de' Medici, of so the famous Medici family. So it was, it was clear that he, um, although doctrinally a, a Calvinist, uh, he had the sort of pragmatic, pragmatic political view of things. And, of course, famously upon converting to Roman Catholicism, he said, Paris is well worth a mass. Uh, that is, to win over the hearts of his subjects was worth, it was, it's a play on words, uh, it was worth going to Mass, attending Mass as a Catholic, uh, but also a Mass. It was worth a Mass, like a Mass of gold. So he settled the fears of the Roman Catholics in this way. However, um, at that point, then, what do you do for your own people, the Huguenots? Well, he then shortly thereafter issued the Edict of Nantes. And the Edict of Nantes was um, a, a, a declaration by the king, a proclamation by the king that allowed the Huguenots a limited form of freedom of worship. And by that I mean that, that it allowed the Huguenots to publicly worship as Huguenots freely in certain areas where they were in the majority. Uh, outside of those areas, they were not permitted to worship freely and publicly as Huguenots. But within those areas, they could worship freely and publicly, areas where they were in the majority, these sort of little Huguenot enclaves. It also permitted them to build walls uh, to protect those enclaves. Uh, Henri understood that um, this was a proclamation of the king, which a future king could rescind, um, could reject. And so really the only thing that, that, that was certain to protect the, the freedoms, the religious freedoms of the Huguenots was walls that they could build, hide behind, and, and sort of defend their right against uh, a future king who might try to take it away. So in this way, he tried to sort of balance the interests of both uh, groups that had been fighting. He balanced the interests of the Roman Catholics by converting to their faith and marrying a Roman Catholic. He balanced the interests of the Huguenots by extending them this limited freedom of worship and this means of protecting it. So he's trying to sort of settle everybody down. And, and I get the impression that, that this was a guy whom 80% of the French people approved of. Uh, because in doing this, it did bring an end to the civil wars that had been raging for decades, for generations really, and uh, it helped to, to, again, restore stability, which allowed France's economy to start growing again, um, and that's why you know, he is remembered so fondly by the French people. But I get the impression, on the other hand, that you still had sort of 10% of Roman Catholics uh, who were who were opposed to him simply on the basis of the fact that and, and didn't trust him on the basis of the fact he had been a Huguenot and had fought against them. Maybe ten percent of Huguenots who didn't trust him because he had, they, in their mind, uh, turned their back, turned his backs on them and had converted. And so you have these radicals on both sides who don't like him. And eventually, one of these in 1610 assassinated him. Um, Henri of Navarre was stabbed multiple times while being drawn through a, a crowded Paris street. Um, and murdered by a radical. His wife, his widow, Maria de' Medici, then um, essentially ascended to the throne because her son, who would be King Louis XIII, he was only nine years old. 
and at age nine was not expected to be able to effectively administer the kingdom. And so um, his mother, uh, Henri's wife, Marie de Medici, his widow, uh, operated as, as regent. So ruling in the place of her nine-year-old son, pending that time when he would be of age and, and, and could rule the kingdom in reality himself. Um, she appointed, as her son's uh, tutor and an advisor, she appointed Armand Duplessis, who was known as Cardinal Richelieu. He was um, one of the chief uh, church leaders in France, clearly a cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church, and she expected that, uh, that Richelieu could, could establish for her son the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church, and the the faith that went along with it, but then also a an understanding of statecraft because Richelieu was well known as a diplomat and and as a political leader. What perhaps Marie did not get was that uh, that Richelieu, uh, his although a cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church, in many ways his real religion was power, and the the statecraft side and the diplomacy side of him was much stronger than the spiritual side. And so, as he tutored and advised Louis the Thirteenth over a period of seven years, um, he he really instilled secular goals uh, in Louis the Sixth, Louis the Thirteenth. First of all, a goal to make himself sort of an absolute monarch, um, to assume the power, at least of an absolute monarch, to eliminate those within France who might stand in his way or challenge his power, and then secondly, to make France the strongest state in Europe. It has really nothing to do with the doctrines of the church. And I think that Marie eventually, Marie de Medici's maybe eventually figured this out, that this is what was going on between the cardinal and her son. But by then it was too late because um, in 1617, um, Louis announced that he was now ready. You know, he's 16 years old. Uh, he was now ready to, um, to ascend to the throne and rule France. Marie de Medici told him he wasn't, uh, that she perceived that the cardinal had influenced him wrongly, um, and he tried to buy her off. He, he constructed a fantastic palace for her on the outskirts of Paris. It's, uh, it's uh, today the home of the French Senate, and it's adjacent to the Luxembourg Gardens. The gardens used to be called the Medici Gardens because this was where Marie de Medici was sort of put by her son in an effort to quiet her down. She never did quiet down. She was always involved in intrigues to topple Cardinal Richelieu um, because Richelieu had, it was very clear, positioned himself now to be not simply an advisor to Louis XIII, but um, to almost almost be his, um, he was relied upon to a point where Louis XIII completely, utterly relied on him for advice and decision-making. And Marie de Medici, throughout the rest of her life, made a couple of different attempts to, to topple Richelieu and remove him from power. Uh, eventually, her son, Louis the Louis XIII, banished her, um, and she is forced to, to, to leave. So it kind of goes to show that Richelieu had succeeded in instilling his goals, uh, get rid of the people who might stand in your way, and that, that was one of those, uh, anybody who might challenge you for power. Of course, uh, a bigger concern for Richelieu were the Huguenots, because as a result of the Edict of Nantes issued by Louis' father, they had these walled cities behind which they could defend themselves and defy the king. And so Richelieu advised um, advised Louis XIII to make war on the Huguenots and and essentially if they were not willing to take down these walls, which they were not, for the most part. Uh, and so at that point then, a sort of civil war broke out between, um, once again, between the government of France, now very firmly uh, established and, and united around its cause uh, and its leader, uh, so the forces of Louis XIII and Richelieu versus the Huguenots. And the Huguenots refused, for the most part, to give up their walls, and so... Um, they had to be brought down by force. And so there's a period of, of what, nine, ten years that this war is going on. Uh, the last of the Huguenot walled cities to hold out was called La Rochelle. Uh, it was a port city on the sort of the west coast of France and uh, had, to be, um, had to be besieged. And yet, uh, because it was a port city, the siege dragged on and on because they could continue to resupply themselves by sea. 
And it got to a point where Richelieu himself personally oversaw the siege, and in the end, La Rochelle was eventually toppled. Uh, But in the meantime, uh, to the east, uh, the Holy Roman Empire had erupted into, into war, and it was also a war between uh, Protestants and uh, Roman Catholic uh, authorities. The, the Holy Roman Emperor, the, the Habsburg Emperor, Ferdinand II, uh, was faced with a, a rebellion by the Bohemians, who, although initially Roman Catholic, were now considering uh, a pivot toward Lutheranism. Many of the northern princes, the northern German princes, had already converted to Lutheranism under the terms of the Peace of Augsburg, negotiated by Charles V, and the Bohemians had not done that. Now they were considering doing that, and and this led to a a fight between the Habsburg uh, imperial forces and the Bohemians. Well, the Bohemians were crushed, uh, but then Ferdinand II had had gotten into the idea of, of achieving his goal of restoring Roman Catholicism throughout his empire, and having defeated the Bohemians and some of their allies, he then turned his forces northward and had begun to make war on the rest of the Lutherans in what was what is now today Germany. Um, this had actually drawn other Lutheran states into the war, first Denmark and then Sweden. And at first, uh, Ferdinand II had approached Louis XIII and Richelieu about French support uh, bring the, bringing these two strong Roman Catholic states together to eliminate Protestantism throughout Europe. And um, at the th- first occasion when Ferdinand appealed to the French for assistance, uh, La Rochelle, the siege of La Rochelle, was still going on. And uh, Richelieu and, and Louis XIII sort of replied that although they would love to assist Ferdinand um, as long as they were busy fighting their own uh, religious minorities, uh, they really couldn't assist uh, the Habsburgs. And, um, and so the war went on. This was the Thirty Years' War. The war in Germany went on. And then what happened was, after Sweden's entry into the war, a series of real disasters be- befell the Habsburg imperial forces. And Ferdinand II was forced to appeal again to Louis XIII and to Richelieu for assistance. Uh, praying that they might intervene on behalf of uh, of the Habsburg forces, on behalf of the empire, uh, in the name of Roman Ca- the Roman Catholicism. And by now, the Rola Rochelle had fallen, and the Huguenot walled cities had been reduced, and that issue was gone. And it is true, uh, then, that in 1635, uh, Louis XIII and Richelieu uh, intervened in the Thirty Years' War. But astonishingly, they intervened on the side of the Lutherans, uh, not on the side of the Habsburgs, and this really shows you this really shows you what kind of leader Richelieu was and how thoroughly he had allowed himself to become absorbed in the secular side of leadership and how how little uh, loyalty to the Roman Catholic Church really meant to him because you know Richelieu was a practitioner of what we would call today raison d'etat r a i s o n d apostrophe E with an accent, T-A-T, raison d'etat, the, the, the rationality of the state, which essentially holds that, that when making decisions in foreign policy, or I suppose really domestic policy as well, but generally speaking, raison d'etat is considered a, a, an approach to foreign policy, that when making decisions in foreign policy, the interests of the state outweigh all other uh, influences, uh, including moral influences. And so although you might um, see the moral uh, necessity as a Roman Catholic monarch of supporting your fellow Roman Catholics if their goal is to expand Roman Catholicism, in this case, the interest of the state trumps that moral necessity or that moral impulse. And in the eyes of Richelieu, the interest of the French state was to stomp all over the Habsburgs uh, and and in doing so, allow France to ascend to the position of strongest state in Europe. Uh, that, after all, was one of the goals that Richelieu had worked to instill in Louis the Thirteenth. And here was the opportunity to do it. The Habsburgs uh, had managed the strongest state in Europe up till this time. Now, by weakening them, France could ascend to that position. And many believe that the decision of Louis the Thirteenth and Richelieu 
back before, when they were first approached by Ferdinand II to intervene in this war, the Thirty Years' War, they believed that the, the fact that, that the France, French had sort of refused to get involved at that time uh, was actually evidence of raison d'etat as well. The excuse they gave was that they were still fighting the Huguenots, but that in fact they were happy to sit back and watch the Habsburgs struggle and and it, the more years the Habsburgs had to fight against the Lutherans, the weaker they would be, and in the end, be easier pickings for the French. So this was the pra- this was the practice of raison d'état, and and it culminated then in the French decision, Louis, Louis' decision, and really Richelieu's decision to enter the Thirty Years' War on behalf of the Lutherans against the Roman Catholic Empire. So, um, interestingly, this did not spell the immediate end of the war and the immediate defeat of the Habsburgs. In fact, it brought great suffering to the French people because the Habsburgs' cousins, the Spanish Habsburgs, invaded France. And as a result of that, the French forces were not able to throw all of their resources into supporting the Lutherans against the Habsburgs, the Austrian Habsburgs, against the empire. They had to defend themselves against an invasion by the Spanish. And so the war dragged on, and then the negotiations began, and the negotiations dragged on. And in the end, in 1648, the Peace of Westphalia brought an end to the Thirty Years' War. By 1648, Louis XIII had died. Richelieu himself had also died. Um, and uh, really, the, the Peace of Westphalia did not, uh, did not do a lot for France. Um, in the end... The greatest benefit that the French got out of this was that the Habsburgs essentially lost control of the Holy Roman Empire, and uh, that meant that they were uh, very much in decline in terms of their power, and that opened up the opportunity for France to be that much stronger. But as I mentioned, by this time Louis XIII and Richelieu had both died, and now Louis XIV had ascended to the throne. This is Louis XIV who will become ultimately known as the Sun King, the Roi Soleil, the Sun King, and he ruled France for 72 years. But at that time, again, he was a child, and his regent was a cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church, Cardinal Mazarin, uh, M-A-Z-A-R-I-N, sometimes pronounced Mazarin. It was really Mazarin who had dominated the negotiations of the Peace of Westphalia, but Mazarin basically shared the same sorts of goals that Richelieu did. He perhaps didn't execute uh, quite so much authority over the mind of Louis the Fourteenth as Richelieu carried over the Louis the Thirteenth, but he was extremely influential and, and brought forward those same goals of establishing the absolute monarchy in France and establishing the superiority of France in Europe. Louis the Fourteenth enthusiastically embraced those goals as well. His predecessor, uh, Louis the Thirteenth, had, um, for example. Uh, forced the Huguenots to give up their walls, uh, Louis the Fourteenth rescinded the entire treaty or Edict of Nantes, and uh, and Huguenots were forced to flee from France entirely. Louis the Fourteenth was not interested in having dissidents around, and so this is the time when when many many Huguenots fled to Prussia or fled to uh, the Netherlands or even to um, some of them end up in America in what is to be today or what is to be the United States. And the French, you know, at the time maybe didn't realize it, but they lost a lot of great minds at that point. But then Louis XIV began to, to turn toward the next greatest threat to his absolute authority, which was his own nobles. Um, you know, during the medieval era, the nobles had been stronger than the king, and there had, there had been places like England where the nobles had actually been able to exert a certain degree of, of power and claim for themselves some uh, leverage over the king. That's what Magna Carta was all about. And, you know, by this time in England, you had uh, a, a functioning parliament that was a, uh, a an institution with which the king was forced to share his power. Louis XIV didn't want his nobles to be able to um, to exercise that kind of influence over him. He was particularly concerned about them. And so, in in his in fulfillment of his declaration that l'état c'est moi i am the state uh, louis began to find ways to reduce the power and influence of france's nobles one of the the assets that he had going for him at this time was that france's economy was now emerging as a modern economy uh, this process was begun by henri when he brought internal peace to france and it was continued 
And now, under the leadership of Jean-Baptiste Colbert, who was Louis XIV's finance minister, the French economy was approaching that of England as a a modern economy, uh, an economy based not solely on agriculture, but based on commerce as well. Uh, And um, once you have an economy that is based at least partly on commerce, you end up in a position where, as, as a king, you can have some, some independent power of your own because in an agriculture-based economy, all of the wealth filters upward. And literally, it's, in an agriculture-based economy, the wealth begins in the ground and it grows up and then it's harvested and then it works its way up through the nobles and a portion of it makes its way to the king. The king is entirely reliant on the nobles for wealth. He is entirely reliant on the nobles for defense. Um, That's the whole point of the feudal system. The nobles pledge their loyalty to the king. They will defend him. They will protect him in return for the use of his land. Um, And they're entirely dependent upon the nobles for the administration of the law. They have no independent wealth. Therefore, they have no basis to run the government separately from the nobles. They're totally reliant on the nobles for all those things. But now that France's economy was modernizing under the leadership of Colbert, who was promoting things like the establishment of joint joint stock companies and colonies and mercantilism, that sort of thing, and even early manufacturing. Now that the French economy was growing, they could tax commerce. And through the taxation of of increased commerce, uh, the king of France now had at his disposal, and this was a phenomenon going on in most of the Western European countries, the king of France now had at his disposal a sort of an independent source of wealth which he could use to hire an army and hire a bureaucracy. And once he had hired an army and hired a bureaucracy, he really didn't need the nobles for anything. The army could defend the kingdom and would be loyal to him and him only because he paid their salary. And he could hire a team of bureaucrats to administer uh, the law and administer policy in the kingdom, and he didn't have to rely on the nobles to do that either. They would do it as he wanted it done because he paid their salary. So the emergence of a modern economy in France really made it possible for for Louis XIV to fulfill and carry forth this vision of absolute monarchy. And so let's talk about the, the administrative side. He replaced the traditional means of governing France, that is through the nobles, with, as I said, an army of bureaucrats. They were known as intendants. Royal intendant, intendants, I-N-T-E-N-D-E-N-T-S. Uh, and um, it was their job then to administer the law, d- to do the daily administration of governing. Their authority trumped that of the nobles, and they were in lockstep with what the king expected. Um, so he didn't need the nobles to carry forth the administration of government anymore. He also hired an independent army. And, uh, and and hired a big one. Uh, he, he basically hired an army numbering almost 500,000 men, and he, he equipped them very differently than armies in the past had, um, had been equipped. He, um, he actually had an entire division of the army, known as the Quartermaster Corps, whose in jo- entire job was logistics, the science of supply. So rather than, uh, rather than an army that was at the at the uh, the will of the nobles and was supplied by them through the nobles wealth uh, this was an army that was independently supplied and independently commanded now don't get me wrong uh, france will still have an army in which the officer corps is made up entirely of nobles uh, that had been the case going back into the medieval era but louis the 14th also established one of europe's first military academies this was a school where officers had to receive training, so that they would receive standardized training and um, and sort of be in lockstep with the policies established by the king. So, you know, by the time Louis XIV was done, he had not only an army that was independent of the nobles, hired independent of them. He didn't. The nobles weren't going out recruiting or drafting their peasants, but rather. The army was essentially a professional army that was paid out of the royal treasury with Louis the Fourteenth at the top of the chain of command but it was so it was a, it was europe 's largest army it was europe 's most professional army now 
it was the best trained, uh, best supplied, and best led army in Europe. So now he doesn't need the nobles. I mean, don't, again, don't get me wrong. The nobles serve as the, as the officers, but they're subordinate to him now. He's not reliant on them for defense. Uh, as a matter of fact, they're more like his employees now. So in so many ways, you know, in, in, in France, Louis XIV was no longer reliant on the nobles for wealth. He was not uh, reliant upon them for administration. He was not reliant upon them for military. So what do you do with them then? Well, he concluded that the best thing he could do is put them all under one roof where he could keep an eye on them. And so he took a, a hunting lodge that had been established by his grandfather uh, about 13 miles outside of Paris at Versailles, and he began a massive construction project of to expand that lodge into an enormous palace, the Palace of Versailles. And the plan was that he would move all of France's nobles into the palace with him, and that over time is exactly what he did. Now, the palace was honeycombed with passageways, uh, that would um, enable uh, Louis' agents to spy on the nobles, keep an eye on them, listen in on their doings, and know what they were up to. But uh, Louis was not uh, satisfied with that alone. He actually paid off nobles for information about each other. And you could not really count on any person keeping your secrets because in the end they were all sort of potentially in cahoots with the king. And so he actually had spies who were who were feeding him information, but he was also getting information from the nobles themselves about what was being said. And he he built this whole sort of cult of personality around himself because uh, at Versailles it was not merely a palace, it was a way of life. And to to be a part of that uh, was a privilege and it meant that your life would be enveloped in luxury. Um, for everything from food to clothing to entertainment, your life would be enveloped in luxury. And it really meant that, that France's nobles, once he moved them in there, didn't have anything to do. And, of course, he had taken away all of their important jobs anyhow. So um, what he wanted them to do was get lost in that life of luxury. And instead, uh, what did they then have to compete for? Well, they had his um, sort of his favor to compete for because in that environment – your social standing, um, your social standing, became attached to proximity to the king, because the king was this larger-than-life figure, and so he would reward nobles who did his bidding. He would reward nobles who fed him information about their fellow nobles by sitting them close to him uh, during meals. Uh, or by rewarding them with opportunities to have access to him at special times of the day. He would conduct two different waking ups. He would wake up one time in his private bedchamber, get fully dressed, and then retire to a public bedchamber where he would be sort of pretend to be asleep, and a, a very small cadre of, of elite nobles who had, who had done him well, who had done him good service, would be allowed in, and they would see him wake up. And they would know what he was wearing, and they could go and they could they could tell all of their friends what the king was going to be wearing that day. And so they had this inside information, and then his friends, would, the, the other nobles, would be astonished and jealous at what, what great access they had to the king. And so this was the way that Louis the Fourteenth sort of kept control of the nobles at, at Versailles. And by the time he was done, he had essentially managed to fulfill that, that statement, I am the state, l'état c'est moi. He had taken what was a very decentralized power structure where the real political power of France was carried by the nobles in a very uh, decentralized way, and he had brought all that power. He had centralized it within his own person. So the other part of, of the legacy of Louis XIII and Richelieu for Louis XIV, then, is to make France the strongest state in Europe, or at least on the continent of Europe. And the reality is that by the time Louis XIV became king, that was already largely true. Um, and you know, Louis XIV found himself in a position of strength where had he been satisfied, he probably could have simply consolidated power and been happy. Um, but Louis XIV saw in the strength of France the opportunity to become stronger still and to expand. And so he really set himself two new goals. France really already was the strongest state in the continent. Now he set himself two new goals. One was to expand France northward 
to what he called its traditional boundary, which he defined as the Rhine River, and that had been the boundary between Roman Gaul and Germania. That meant that France would be absorbing big chunks of what is today Belgium, at that time the Spanish Netherlands. Um, he'd be absorbing big chunks of Belgium, chunks of uh, what is now the, the independent Netherlands, big chunks of the former Holy Roman Empire. And then the other goal was to absorb uh, Spain. Well, he had the army to do it. He had the biggest army in Europe. Um, strongest, best led, best supplied, right? Uh, he waged a series of wars in an effort to expand uh, France's borders to the Rhine. Uh, he never really fully succeeded. These were expensive wars, and he did uh, gain territory in Franche Comte and, and Alsace and places like that, but he did not succeed in fully expanding France's borders all the way to the Rhine. And then he waged another war called, called the War of Spanish Succession, um, which w- was waged from 1701 to 1714, and it was triggered by the end of the Habsburg monarchy in Spain. Uh, Louis XIV had managed to maneuver himself to a position where uh, his grandson, Philippe Bourbon, was actually the, the heir to the throne of Spain. And, um, but, but being too young to rule, had he been allowed to ascend to the throne of Spain, Louis XIV would have served as his regent. And that being the case, Louis XIV would have ruled France and essentially Spain as well. Now, all of this, however, triggered what became known as a balance of power response from the neighbors of France in Europe. A balance of power response is what happens when one state becomes so strong that its very existence threatens the security of its neighbors. We call that a hegemon, and the condition is called hegemony, H-E-G-E-M-O-N-Y, hegemony. France was in danger of becoming a hegemon, of achieving hegemony. And whenever that begins to happen, a typical response of the smaller, weaker neighbors is to forget whatever differences they have and align themselves to fight the growing hegemon in order to, and weaken them in order to bring power back into balance. And that's really what happened to Louis XIV. You know, geez, he built up this big, strong, great army, and then he really wasn't able to do anything effective with it. He didn't accomplish his goals. He is defeated uh, in the War of the Spanish Succession by a grand alliance of just about everybody in Europe, who are, including the British, you know, who had this long-standing rivalry with France, so including the British. Uh, who could have sat it out if they wanted to. They sit there on their island in a, a state of potential isolation, but they jump in. They joined. They led. They were the leaders. The British were the leaders of this grand alliance against Louis XIV. So neither of his two major foreign policy goals were ever achieved. Uh, he did not succeed, despite the size and, and professionalism and strength of his army. He did not succeed in expanding France's borders to the Rhine River, and he lost the War of Spanish Succession. I guess technically he was dead by the time the war ended. Um, but, um, and, and indeed, when, when, the, when the Treaty of Utrecht was negotiated, which brought a, an end to the War of Spanish Succession, the amazing thing about it is Philippe Bourbon, the, the, the grandson in question, was actually allowed to take the throne of Spain. The treaty allowed Philippe Bourbon to accept the throne of Spain. Um, but there was a provision in there which guaranteed that the thrones of Spain and France could never be united. Why was Philippe allowed to do this? Well, by this time, uh, it was clear that, that he was old enough to reign without a um, a regent. And indeed, Louis XIV was going to die here. So uh, so it's, it's strange that the fact that everybody was fighting to prevent this guy from taking the throne of Spain, now he's allowed to. But in reality, what they were fighting against was the growing power of France. Um, in the end, the balance of power thwarted all of Louis XIV's designs. But the fact that the British um, came into this war and, and supported the alliance against the growing hegemon France reminds us of that ongoing rivalry between the British and the French. We hadn't talked a lot about that because in, during a lot of this period that we've been speaking of, the British had been involved in their own civil war, and, and, and so the, the war between the British and the French, or the rivalry between them, so it took a second, uh, a second seat. But now, in the 18th century, 
that rivalry erupted again. And in particular, it erupted in a series of wars during the 17th century that culminated in what was known as the Seven Years' War, uh, which broke out in 1756. The Seven Years' War saw France um, fighting against uh, the British primarily, but also the Prussians. And what happened here was that uh, the, the French uh, were, were trying to, to expand their growing empire in North America. Um, it was an empire that was more of an interior empire. It was the, sort of the Great Lakes region and the Ohio River Valley. Uh, the British colonies were on the east coast of North America. And, um, and meanwhile, on the continent of Europe, there were ongoing disputes over, uh, over the results of previous wars. Um, the important figure in the Seven Years' War on the British side was William Pitt, um, because William Pitt conceived that this war would primarily be about the future of North America. And so he poured uh, the full resources of the British Empire and, and went even ex- beyond their resources and put them into debt to fight the French. And um, although the French initially, in the first couple of years of the war, uh, were, were beating the British and their allies just about everywhere they fought uh, on the North American continent, by 1758, Pitt's plan was beginning to, to tell its tale and the tide of the war was turning against the French. Pitt had also reached out and established an alliance with Frederick the Great of Prussia. And what this meant was that, that France would not be able to to match the British effort in North America because they were going to be too busy fighting against Prussia, essentially fighting on, on two, two whole different theaters. Um, and, by the way, there was fighting still in India at this time. Uh, under Louis XIV, Colbert, his, his finance minister, had encouraged the expansion of French colonial interests. The French had entered into a an East India company had established a joint stock company, an East India company, just as the British had done. Uh, the French had set up sort of on the east coast of India, the British on the west coast. And so there was fighting there during the Seven Years' War as well to see who would gain control of the, the Indian trade. So um, so the French ultimately lost the Seven Years' War. Uh, this was a, another sort of disaster for them. Uh, the wars of Louis XIV had already been disastrous. The Seven Years' War was another one. The French lost all, basically all of their possessions in North America as a result of the Treaty of Paris, established in 1763. And maybe the bigger disaster of all of this was the, the enormous debt that the French had placed themselves in over this hundred years or so uh, since Louis XIV had begun to put his great plans into execution. Um, the British, of course, are going to run into debt problems with their American colonists because they're going to insist that their American colonists uh, foot the bill for paying off a lot of that debt, and the, that issue of taxation is going to lead to the, the War of American Independence. In France, the issue is not that, that far off, because Louis XIV incurred massive debts in order to hire this army of bureaucrats, these intendants, to administer his kingdom for him, to expand his army massively, to, um, to wage these wars that he had waged, four major wars, uh, against um, against really all of Europe uh, to build the Palace of Versailles, and then his his successor Louis the Fifteenth had done the same thing by waging the Seven Years' War, and at least and what made it worse, none of these wars produced any positive results for France. So by the time you get into the 1770s, when say Louis the Sixteenth became king in 1774, uh, the French state was beset by debt, massive debt. And really, uh, without a clear path for, for uh, extinguishing that debt. In fact, in many ways, uh, the court of Louis XVI not only didn't have a plan for extinguishing the debt, uh, they actually added to it. Uh, first of all, um, Louis XIV's wife, Marie Antoinette Habsburg, um, to whom Louis had been married as a way of cementing the new alliance between France and Austria, um, she was a big spender. As a matter of fact, her nickname among uh, members of the court was Madame Deficit uh, because she wanted the very best in everything from food to clothing to hairstyle to jewelry. Uh, she seemed to be particularly out of touch with the realities of her spending. And the thing was that in the court of Versailles, uh, 
uh, to stand out. You had to sort of up that that I don't know what you're gonna that performance. Uh, and so, as a Habsburg, she was used to luxury, and now moving to the court of Versailles, she had to bump that up to stand out among all the others. So that certainly didn't help matters. Uh, but then, additionally, um, France France's participation in the War of American Independence was very expensive and expanded on the debt that Louis inherited. Uh, they did it, it really just to stick it to the British. It was part of that ongoing rivalry. It's not that the French particularly loved the American experiment with democracy. It's that they were trying to find another way to stick it to the British. And once again, they came out uh, taking the worst of it because although French support was essential to the American victory, um, the French entry into the war threw open a, a global war, and uh, the British beat the French everywhere else. They fought out on the high seas in the Caribbean, in India. As a matter of fact, uh, the British defeated the French during the War of American Independence in India, pretty much um, ended France's competition with the British for control of Indian trade. So again, another expensive war that, that cost the French, really, uh, didn't, was not, did not bear fruit for them, other than they had the satisfaction of seeing Britain lose their 13 American colonies. So uh, Louis XVI had no plan to extinguish the debt. Instead, he was adding to it. Um, he did hire a couple of fairly capable finance ministers, uh, one of whom, on Robert Jacques Turgot, T-U-R-G-O-T, Turgot, basically laid it out and said, look, in order to, to eliminate this debt, you're going to have to cut way back on your spending. And in particular, he pointed out the, the lavish lifestyles of the nobles and the royal family at Versailles. And for that, he, of course, earned the, the disdain of Marie Antoinette, and he was, Turgot was sacked and, and replaced by Jacques Necker, uh, N-E-C-K-E-R. And Necker essentially came to the same conclusion. You're going to have to cut back on your spending. And he was sacked. Now, eventually, Necker was brought back. And what Necker said to to the, the king was, look, the real problem with trying to retire this debt is that we are not taxing the people in our society who are most capable of paying taxes. So this brings us around to to the one of the most upsetting um, components of the, the ancien regime, the old regime, as it was called by revolutionaries. Um, and that was that as a result of feudal contracts and medieval traditions, Neither the nobles nor the church were paying taxes in France. And uh, they were the largest landholders in France. By far, they were the wealthiest people slash institutions in France, and yet exempt from paying taxes. So French society at this time was divided into three estates. This is under the Ancien Regime, the old regime, the first estate, which was the clergy, the second estate, which were the nobles, and then the third estate, which were everybody else. Which is a reminder to us that to be a member of the third estate did not mean that you were dirt poor living in a shack somewhere. Um, the third estate included the wealthy businessmen, the, the people, the leaders of commerce, the leaders of banking. And again, since the French economy was modernizing, you had these. You had wealthy merchants, wealthy bankers, early industrialists, uh, people like that, investors. So you, the third estate included wealthy people, influential people, uh, but they too paid taxes on their income. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, as a matter of fact, the third estate included some peasants who were landowners. Um, France uh, had abolished the feudal system in the sense, or had abolished serfdom. Um, but and, and as a matter of fact, French peasants were eligible to own land, and probably there was a larger uh, percentage of Fren French peasants who owned land uh, than in any other country in Europe, including in Britain. Um, and so, but those French peasant landowners, they were paying taxes as well. And indeed, the, the land tax was the most hated tax. It was called the TAIA, T-A-I-L-L-E. That was the most hated tax because, um, because, of course, the people who earned the most from their possession of land, the nobles and the church, were exempt from it. Again, this was part of their feudal contracts. So, you know, everybody else, third estate was being taxed about 50% of their income. And the first and second estate were being taxed at, at less than 1% of their income. And in the meantime, um, it was a very uneven distribution of land anyway. The third estate possessed about 70% uh, of, the, of the land in France, and the first and second estate possessed about 30% of it. We say, oh, well, you know, they, they possessed, the, the two smallest estates possessed a smaller share of the land. Yes, but 
In terms of population, the first and second estate composed 1 to 2 percent of the population, but they possessed 30 percent of the land. So there was a problem with there was a problem with the distribution of most important productive resource in a highly agricultural country, land. Uh, you have a problem with uh, exemptions from paying taxes. Um, there were additional privileges of the first and second estate. So, for example, the king could command labor from his subjects. It was called corvée, C-O-R-V-E-E. Um, but the first and second estate were, were immune from this. Um, you could also add the fact that... Um, you could add the fact that the first and second estate alone were privileged to hunt on, on uh, publicly held lands. Um, the hunting privilege was restricted to them. So peasants, uh, in the event that they were impoverished, uh, there was a bad harvest or something, they couldn't even supplement their diets by hunting. At least they weren't legally allowed to do so. So there was a whole there were a whole array of inequalities and privileges and and problems that, that were uh, endemic to French society under the Ancien Regime on the eve of the, of the revolution. But the big problem was the taxes, because the wealthiest people in society couldn't be taxed. So in an effort to eliminate the debt, you were attempting to, to you know, say, squeeze blood out of a turnip. Uh, you were trying to tax the people who were least capable of paying, uh, and you weren't taxing at all those who were most capable of paying. And Jacques Necker... Uh, presented this problem to Louis the Sixteenth and said, "You got to change this. You've got to, in order for you to retire this debt, you're going to have to start taxing the first and second estate." The problem is that those sorts of decisions, increasingly, well, increasingly, those sorts of decisions weren't being made in the history of France. But when those sorts of decisions were being considered, usually the king summoned a body called the Estates General. The Estates General was like a parliament, but it was essentially powerless. I wouldn't say it's powerless. It was essentially a rubber stamp for, for what the king wanted. Because in the estates general, although the first, second, and third estates were all represented, and the third estate actually always had the largest delegation because it represented the largest portion of French society, in voting, each estate got one vote. So the first estate, one vote. Second estate, one vote. Third estate, one vote. And typically, proposals made by the king were favorable to the first and second estate, so they would vote in favor, and then the third estate would vote against, and it wouldn't matter because they were being outvoted two to one. So in a lot of ways, this, this estates general was not a functioning parliament in reality. Um, it was more of a rubber stamp for what the king was proposing. So Necker, in addition, proposed to Louis the Sixteenth that not only should he summon the estates general, the estates general and propose a plan to tax the first and second estate, but he also proposed that, that they would have to change the voting procedure so that it was more of a one-man, one-vote. Each delegate would get a vote, and then the third estate could overwhelm the first and second estate with their votes. So this was the plan. Um, in 1789, the estates general was summoned, and the plan was to, to alter the voting procedure. The problem was that, that Louis the Sixteenth was, I think, a good guy, um, by all accounts, a good father, a loving husband, but, but not a super bright guy. Clearly a guy who was um, subject to being influenced by others. He desperately wanted to be liked by the people around him. And what that usually meant was that his, his decision on any his stance on any decision that had to be made was always in flux, and it usually was determined by whoever had talked to him most recently. And what we find out is that, of course, most of his advisors were nobles. And when they got wind of this plan, they quickly got into his brain and began to point out to him what a dangerous thing it was to give this sort of uh, expansive power to the third estate. What what might they do with that power? And, and already, even before the estates general was was summoned, uh, they were working on Louis the Sixteenth's fears of the third estate. That only multiplied because after the members of the third estate uh, delegation were elected, and they were elected in what at that time was probably um, the largest election in European history. Uh, in terms of the sheer numbers of people voting. But once they were elected, they assembled what were known as cahiers de doléance, catalogs of complaint, or notebooks of complaint, which they intended to read to the king upon the, su the summoning of the estates general. They intended to do this before they even considered any of the king's proposals. They figured this was their chance. 
So as soon as the Estates General was summoned and was, was convened, these guys come with their, ca their catalogs of complaint and they begin to read out of these. Well, that played right into the hands of the noble advisors who said to the king, ah, you see, you can see that these, the third estate is so dissatisfied and they're dissatisfied with your government and they're dissatisfied with monarchy and they're dissatisfied with everything about all of the institutions of our, our, our old system. And so that just allowed them to, to allow those noble advisors to work on the king even more. So, um, Finally, they managed to persuade the king not to alter the voting procedure. They persuaded him that it was, it was contrary to his interests and it was indeed, indeed dangerous to put that kind of power in the hands of the third estate. And so when it was announced that that change would not be made, the third estate erupted in protest. They were very upset. And the next day, though, they found that their entry into the estates general had been barred. They were locked out. And so members of the third estate left, and they reconvened in the nearest large public space they could find, which was an indoor tennis court. And there they declared themselves the National Assembly. Now, uh, the third estate delegation was made up mostly of middle-class people. Um, again, you're, you're men of commerce, men of banking, men of early manufacturing, that group of people, maybe some guild masters. Um, some professionals, lawyers, and stuff like that. There were even some members of the second estate and first estate present. These were sympathizers. And the reason why was that uh, the Enlightenment had greatly influenced these people. These were people of wealth, people of leisure. But because they were people of wealth and leisure, they actually had time to read the new philosophy that was coming out at that time, which emphasized the necessity of a government that was responsive to the needs of its people and natural rights and things like that. And so there were members of the first and second estate present at the National Assembly as well. And they declared that as the elected representatives of the French people, they were in fact the legitimate government of the French people, and they would now start making laws for France. Well, of course, that just, you know, even more played into the hands of the nobles and their, their, the advice that they were giving Louis XVI. Ah, you see, this is exactly what we were talking about. They claim that they're le the legitimate government, and you're not. So it just it's sort of in, um, confirmed in his mind that he made the right decision by locking them out. So eventually soldiers were sent to the tennis court in an effort to disband the National Assembly and sort of send them home. They were met by the Comte de Mirabeau, uh, M-I-R-A-B-E-A-U, who was one of these members of the Second Estate who had joined and was, had essentially become the leader of the National Assembly. Um, he essentially told the soldiers to go home and to tell the king that, that, that they were the true government of France and that he needed to back off and, and they, wouldn't, they wouldn't back off. They themselves would not back off under the threat of bayonets and anything else. And these soldiers went back and they failed. They failed to disband the National Assembly. Instead, the members of the National Assembly, having pronounced themselves already the true legitimate government of France, now took an oath, which was known as the Tennis Court Oath, wherein they pledged to continue to meet continuously until they had developed a constitution for France. So a new constitution for France. If the king wasn't freaked out before, he would be pretty freaked out now. Again, the nobles are saying, look, this is exactly what we were talking about. The third estate is up to no good. But in the meantime, before the king could assemble any kind of uh, force to go in and, and again, attempt to uh, overthrow the, the assembly, Quickly, many soldiers from his army abandoned his army, deserted their posts, so to speak, and joined instead an outfit which became known as the National Guard. The National Guard uh, was a force of 30,000 men or more uh, who were pledged to protect the National Assembly. They had left France's army, so most of these people were trained soldiers. And they were under the command of, of the Marquis de Lafayette, the famous young French officer who had joined in the American Revolution and had served with George Washington. So the Marquis de Lafayette commanded the National Guard. They needed guns, they needed gunpowder, and they acquired guns from the Hôtel des Invalides, which was a sort of old folks' home uh, slash home for wounded soldiers that had been established by Louis XIV because his regime had produced a lot of them. Uh, but there were guns stored there. They acquired the guns. There was no gunpowder. Um, but gunpowder was rumored to be at the Bastille on the other side of town. So the National Guard, joined by a bunch of just general rabble from the city, went and they stormed the Bastille. Bastille was 
a fortress that had been part of the medieval defenses of the city, but now was being used essentially as a prison for political prisoners and um, had become a symbol then of royal tyranny and the tyranny of, of the king under the Ancien Regime. Stormed the Bastille, uh, captured the commandant, cut off his head, paraded around on a stick, overwhelmed the guards. They let all the political prisoners out. Turns out there were seven. Um, but there they acquired their gunpowder and so on. And so the storming of the Bastille on July 14, 1789 is sort of, it's said to mark the beginning of the French Revolution. Um, soon, however, the violence and the, uh, the revolutionary spirit spread outside the city of Paris into the surrounding countryside. And for the remainder of the summer, sort of July, August, September of 1789, peasants, hearing the news of the revolution, now rose up uh, in mass against the nobles. And this, there's a period known as Le Grand Peur, the Great Fear, a period of about two months in which the peasants storm around the countryside, um, rousting nobles out of their homes, burning their possessions, uh, beating them beating them up, uh, murdering them in, in many cases. Probably 20,000 died, um, and, and 200,000 more fled. Uh, this is the point at which many of France's nobles realized that this was not a place to stay, and they ended up fleeing from France, and they became what were called émigrés, um, people who have left. And, and they, they, they emigrate to Austria, to Prussia primarily. Austria is a natural place for them to go to. That's the, the family of the, the royal family, the Habsburgs of Marie Antoinette. Uh, Prussia, another fairly conservative place, a place where nobles are respected, so they flee there, and one of the things that happened is they bring to the those countries, they bring to the nobles of those countries, and then through their nobles to the royalty of those countries, this fear of the, of the peasants. There's a fear in Austria, a fear in Prussia. Well, if the French peasants can rise up like this, what if our peasants do that? It's possible. France had been regarded as sort of the model, and, and the French monarchy had been regarded as the model, absolute monarchy, and now... It seemed like the peasants were out of control, and so great fear spread to those countries, and that's when there began to be talk in those countries of, hey, we've got to go in there and, and, and tamp this out before it gets really big. Uh, shortly thereafter, um, the women of Paris uh, marched on Versailles. They marched because there was lack of food. There was lack of bread in particular. They had a couple uh, harvests in a row with, with very poor grain production. People were starving. And so the women of Paris, accompanied by the National Guard, marched out to Versailles, overpowered the guards, and um, captured the royal family. This is the moment when uh, Marie Antoinette is reputed to, to have said, there's no bread, let them eat cake. Well, let them eat cake is a reference to, to the leftovers in the pan when you make bread. It's the residue leftover. She was essentially saying that um, if there was not enough bread, they should be scraping the residue out of the pan and eating that. Um, she probably didn't actually say it. It was probably something that was created by the anti-monarchist um, press as propaganda. But it reflects the kind of disengagement and lack of, of sympathy that Marie Antoinette was reputed to have for the plight of the French people. Regardless, the royal family was captured, and they were marched back to Paris, and they were essentially placed under house arrest at the um, Palace of Tuileries in the city of Paris. From that point on, they would be kept under the watch of the city, and they would be under the control of the people now. And that's when the tricolor flag was adopted, the red and blue surrounding the white, because the red and the blue were the traditional colors of the city, the white was the traditional color of the Bourbon family, and this symbolized the fact that the, the, the monarchy was now under the control of the people of the city. And of course then it was common to see the tricolor um, decorated in gold stitching with the three-word slogan of the revolution, which was Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité, Liberty, Equality, Brotherhood, uh, which were supposed to be the guiding principles of the revolution. And in the meantime, uh, in, uh, in the National Assembly, a whole series of um, uh, proposals had been considered and, and enacted, uh, the first of which was the decrees of August 5th, which then formally abolished the feudal system in France and all of the privileges that went with it. Sometimes those are simply referred to as the August Decrees. Um, additionally, then, came the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, 
which uh, is interesting in that it combines the functions of our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, and our Bill of Rights. Um, it outlines, like the Declaration of Independence, it outlines sort of a natural rights philosophy, declaring what the uh, natural rights of, of, of men and citizens are. Um, like our Constitution, it uh, declares that the people are sovereign and that sovereignty resides in the nation, not in any one person. And then, like our Bill of Rights, it lays out certain areas into which the government may not intrude and, and certain rights which may not be trampled on even by the government. And so the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen becomes sort of the touchstone document for the, the rest of the revolution, although it's certainly clear that as the revolution proceeded, many of its principles were, were violated by the revolutionaries. And finally, we have the Civil Constitution of the Clergy, which placed the, the church under state control. You say, wait a minute, wasn't that the pragmatic sanction of Bourges? Uh, no, um, the pragmatic sanction of Bourges had separated France's Roman Catholic Church hierarchy from that of the Roman Catholic Church. So the, um, the bishops and the priests of France were, were now sort of chosen and, um, and they, they operated separate from the authority of the Pope. Uh, and that had continued on for 300 plus years. But the civil constitution of the clergy actually then made the, those priests and bishops into essentially employees of the French state, all of whom were required to, to register loyalty oaths to the, to the new French state. So it, it really placed the church under state control. So by 1791, the National Assembly had been in business for a little less than two years. They had abolished the feudal system uh, and all the privileges that went with it. They had declared the rights of man and citizen, and they had essentially placed the church under the control of the state. Finally, in 1791, they got around to the task that they had declared they would complete before ever disbanding, and that was the establishment of a constitution, the Constitution of 1791. The Constitution of 1791... Uh, did not abolish the monarchy. As a matter of fact, the monarch would remain in place under this constitution as the executive. The monarch would have executive authority, but he would not have absolute authority because he would now be sharing the authority to govern with the legislative assembly. The legislative assembly was the new incarnation of the National Assembly, an elected parliament that would have the legislative power in France. The king's power would be limited to executive power only, and indeed he was referred to henceforth as the hereditary agent of the people. So it would be a hereditary position, but it would be one in which he was limited to carrying forth the laws that the legislative assembly established. He could no longer establish laws himself. At this point, too, it's worth noticing that um, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen apparently did not apply to women because women were not uh, included as uh, possible uh, representatives of the French people in the legislative assembly. And indeed, Olympe de Gouges, uh, issuing the Declaration of the Rights of Woman and Citizen brought forth uh, this this criticism to light. The king, uh, for his part, Louis the Sixteenth, suggested that he was all for this, um, favorable to it all. He appeared with revolutionary leaders in public and, to great public acclaim, spoke in favor of the new constitution. But of course, he and Marie Antoinette had their concerns and indeed plotted to flee and and stage a and stage an effort to restore their absolute power. Uh, they attempted to do so, uh, but were captured. They were captured at Varennes. They were, they were headed toward the Austrian Netherlands. Um, in the Treaty of Utrecht, the Netherlands, which had been under the control of, or not the Netherlands, but the southern part, what is today Belgium, uh, had been under the control of Spain. Uh, after their defeat in the War of Spanish Succession, the Netherlands went to the Austrians, and the Austrians, being the royal family of Marie Antoinette, were allies of, of, of Louis and Marie Antoinette. So they were trying to flee to the Austrian Netherlands, what is today Belgium. But they didn't quite make it. They were captured and brought back to, um, brought back to Paris and, again, placed under house arrest. Um, at that point, then, the, the, the Prussians and the Austrians issued what became known as the Pilnitz Declaration, P-I-L-L-N-I-T-Z, the Pilnitz Declaration, or Declaration of Pilnitz in which they essentially said that, that they were willing to move into France and topple the new government and restore the monarchy, but they were only willing to do so if everybody in Europe acted in concert. So we're ready to go do this as long as everybody else does it with us. So not exactly a statement of bold leadership. 
But soon, it didn't matter, because um, what happened was the Legislative Assembly had been taken over by a group of radicals called the Girondins, G-I-R-O-N-D-I-N-S, the Girondins. And they were radicals in the sense that they believed that their revolution, the French Revolution, was just the beginning of a worldwide revolution against tyranny. And they now wanted to carry this revolution forward uh, to the rest of the world, and, and they targeted the Austrian Netherlands. Why the Austrian Netherlands? Well, the people living there, the Walloons, um, also the region known as Wallonia, so again, part of Belgium today, uh, they were very much like the French. They spoke a language that was very similar to French. They were Roman Catholic, and so on. And they wanted to liberate them from the tyranny of, of the Austrian monarchy. And so the Legislative Assembly declared war on Austria, so Austria now did not have to sit around and, and wait for the rest of Europe to, to say that they wanted them to go in and crush this revolution. Uh, they now had a cause of war against France, but in that France had declared war on them. So now with Austria and now Prussia as well declaring war against France, France was now threatened with foreign invasion. And at this point, French leadership realized something. The, the position of executive, um, which they had given to Louis the Sixteenth in their new constitution, made him commander of the armed forces. And now he was going to be asked to command France's armed forces in a war against two countries who were invading France with the express purpose of putting him back on the throne. So there was a real conflict of interest there. So uh, after less than a year, uh, the Legislative Assembly felt compelled to suspend the, the Constitution of 1791 and reconstitute themselves as the National Convention. What was the National Convention, or what was it supposed to be? Really just a temporary arrangement in which the Legislative Assembly meeting as the National Convention would take over the, the executive authority, which they had forced the king to abandon now because of this conflict of interest. And the National Convention would lead France through the crisis, and then there would be a new constitution when the crisis was over. Um, the National Convention called for volunteers to defend the, 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 father, the fatherland uh, against the, the invading um, Austrians and Prussians. And it was this army of volunteers that went out to the Battle of, of and won the Battle of Valmy, basically fought the Prussians to a standstill at the Battle of Valmy, V A L M Y. Um, and that inspired the La Marseillaise, which became the, the French national anthem. The reality, though, was that as the rest of Europe began to get more serious about suppressing the revolution, there was a realization that, that volunteer armies probably were not going to suffice to defend France against invaders. And at this point also, as the, the threat of invasion became more serious, uh, there was a sense among many French that the Girondin, with this this sort of crazy idea of spreading the revolution worldwide, was going to bring all sorts of fire and brimstone down on France, and that this their this sort of crazy radical adventurism was inappropriate and was dangerous. Instead, a different group of radicals took over control of the convention, and these were the Jacobins. So the Jacobins were also radicals, but they were different. Their radicalism focused on sort of consolidating and, and expanding France's revolution within France, not trying to, to ship it off to other countries and expand it to other countries, but to engage in a more thoroughgoing overturning of the political and social and economic order of France. And so they then, as, as the Girondin came to fall into disrepute for having brought danger to France, the Jacobins moved in and said, okay, we have the solution. We need to do, a, we need to do our revolution better here at home. So they were the ones then who established within the convention the um, Committee of Public Safety, often referred to as the First Committee of Public Safety. And the First Committee of Public Safety was led by Georges Danton, uh, who was a, an outspoken Jacobin. And basically the mission of the First Committee was to organize the defense of France and also to root out uh, any persons within France who were a threat to the revolution and to the new government. Um, in terms of organizing the defense of France, then, it was the first committee that proclaimed levé en masse, L-E-V-E-E-E-N-M-A-S-S-E, -E -E -E, levé en masse, which was, it was a draft. It, it essentially conscripted all military-age, able-bodied men um, for the service of the, the National Army to defend France against the invaders. But it was more than that. Levé en masse basically was a total mobilization of French society for the defense of the revolutionary state. 
Um, you know, there was a job for everybody. Uh, married men would transport weapons and, and build them, and, and women would serve as nurses, and, and old men would make speeches, and children would make bandages. It was a total mobilization of French society for the war effort. The other thing that the Committee of Public Safety did, did was issue the Maximum Price Act, which was an, an, an experiment in, in managing the economy. Uh, bread had been so expensive, it was one of the chief causes of the revolution, the lack of access to food. And so what the Jacobins attempted to do was place an artificially low price, basically put a price ceiling on bread. Um, this backfired in that, although it made bread technically affordable, it made it more scarce, because farmers now, uh, being forced to accept a lower price than they deserved, for their grain, simply stopped producing grain, or they hoarded grain, or they fed the grain to their animals and they produced beef instead. Uh, so it actually made bread harder to come by. So the Committee of Public Safety uh, had, its, had its mistakes. Um, the other thing that they were doing then was, was trying to root out true reactionaries, people who were truly trying to overturn the revolution. They, they were out there. Um, Famously, they were out there in a region called the Vendée, V-E-N-D-E-E, -E, which is in the western part of France um, along the coast. And there you had people who were, who were uh, actually peasant farmers, people for whom the revolution supposedly was being fought. But they were, um, but they were uh, many of them Roman Catholic. They didn't like the civil constitution of the clergy. They didn't like the Maximum Price Act. And they rebelled. And in the Vendean uprising, it was the first sign that not everybody, and not everybody for whom the revolution was supposed to be underway, appreciated it. And uh, the Vendean uprising, however, was, was brutally crushed by Danton and by the army. And yet, despite all of this, um, there were even more radical elements within the Jacobins who wanted Danton to take the role of the committee further. Most famously, Maximilien Robespierre, so Robespierre, R-O-B-E-S-P-I-E-R-R-E. -R -R -E. Robespierre was maybe the most radical of the radicals, who was demanding the most thorough overturning of French society. It was Robespierre who proposed that all of the, he proposed a program of de-Christianization, really, in which... Uh, anything that, that was a reminiscent of the old religious order um, had to be purged out. So names of streets that were named after saints, um, things like that, uh, he wanted that to be eliminated entirely. And so like St. James Street became you know, Street of Liberty or something like that. The, the plaza of, of, of the Holy Family became the plaza of the revolution, stuff that was the kind of thing he was doing. And he was the one who came up with the infamous Republican calendar in which the traditional calendar was eliminated and replaced with a calendar in which each month was exactly 30 days long in the name of equality and the names of the months and the names of the days were changed to eliminate all references to the old regime and also to make it harder for Christians to worship because by eliminating the Sabbath, uh, and going with 10-day weeks, it was harder to keep track of when you were supposed to be worshiping, that kind of thing. That's what Robespierre was up to. He was also up to eliminating any vestiges of royalty or nobility. Um, and so, for example, the, the traditional titles Madame and Monsieur were eliminated, and everybody went by the title Citizen. But Robespierre wanted the Committee of Public Safety to essentially take on a new role, and that is that of sowing an, an environment of terror. He wanted people to be so f afraid of the new government that they wouldn't even think of opposing it or any of its uh, uh, proposals. And what he wanted to do then was to take anybody who, who even had an accusation against them of something slightly treasonous, and he wanted to, um, to have them murdered, basically. Uh, it was under his leadership that Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette then were, were put on trial for treason and executed. Now, there's no question. These two were in cahoots with the Austrians. There was plenty of evidence to demonstrate it. Unfortunately, when they were executed, that brought more, that freaked out other European countries and brought the British into the war against them and brought the Dutch in and so on. But what Robespierre wanted was not to go, I mean, obviously the king and the queen, yes, but to go, over, to go after anybody who might have the slightest um, inkling of, of opposing any element of what the government was doing. And that's why he wanted to create this reign of terror. Uh, Danton was against it. He said, look, I'll go after people who are truly a threat. I'll dog them to the ends of the earth. That's what I, I did to the Vendeans.
in their uprising, but I'm not going to create terror um, for the sake of terror. I'm not going to create random, arbitrary terror. And at that, that point, uh, Robespierre accused Danton of being, uh, or at least of indulging counter-revolutionaries, and he was put on trial and executed. And so then you have what's called the Second Committee of Public Safety, which is the Committee of Public Safety under the leadership of Robespierre, and he did carry out the Reign of Terror, uh, which lasted about a year and a half and resulted in thirty to 40,000 people killed. Um, anything that could be perceived as being slightly counter-revolutionary, a criticism of a government policy, uh, the, the unwillingness to, to sell grain, things like that, desertion from the army, uh, these all became capital offenses, and you'd be brought up before a special court known as the Revolutionary Tribunal, at which you were not, you had no right to, to confront the witnesses who were accusing you, you had no right to call witnesses of your own, and all crimes brought before the Revolutionary Tribunal were capital crimes, could be punished by death. And of course, that's when the guillotine really began to to, to be used. Uh, the guillotine was, was considered to be a great step forward because it killed people so efficiently and, and with, uh, with, uh, with such little suffering. And, and thousands, tens of thousands of people were guillotined during the, the reign of terror in the, name of, in the name of silencing opposition to the government. And that's when I say, you know, the, the principles of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen were just kind of thrown out the window. Finally, uh, things began to turn against Robespierre. For one thing, um, he had sort of justified a lot of these very radical measures on the basis that France was being invaded. And in order to defend France, we must, we must take these radical steps. Well, the French armies were doing very, very well. Um, the fact of the matter was that because France was fighting for its life, basically, because France was fighting to maintain this political system that they had created and that they believed in, the people of France were willing to mobilize everything they had in its defense. They're fighting, on the other hand, against monarchies, where, you know, really, what, what good did it do to the soldiers of the Austrian army uh, to, to defeat the French? They had, didn't, didn't have the same motivation. The Austrian or Prussian people didn't have motivation necessarily. It was their monarchs who were sending them forward. And so, no surprise that French armies did very well. But as they did, it sort of undermined the argument Robespierre had for all of his radical policies. Um, the threat was not as great as it seemed. The economy was a mess. Dechristianization angered many of his own people. And people began to grow increasingly tired of, of, of living under this constant threat of death. And so finally, they turned against Robespierre, and he himself was put on trial and, and sent to the guillotine. Now, following that, the French people kind of probably took a moment to look around, and, and they saw the, the direction that their revolution had gone, and it had gone from being this sort of moderate revolution designed to make the government more responsive to the people, and it turned into this nightmare. And it seems that their reaction is, oh, oh my gosh, how did we let this happen? So they finally adopted a new constitution that, that created an executive that was the exact opposite of the almost essentially dictatorial committee of public safety. It was a, an executive committee, a committee of five men known as directors, and the, the committee was known as the directory. And it was designed to be deliberately uh, slow-moving and sort of uh, weak. All five directors had to agree on any policy before it could be carried forth. Each director had a veto power that he could use to block any move of the government that he found unsatisfactory. So the whole point was you got to get all five people to agree on anything before you can move forward. And this was designed to, to slow down things, slow things down, and make government more deliberate. Well, it did, but it also made the government much less um, capable of managing a crisis. And they got a crisis because now the royalists, now the counter-revolutionaries who had really had their heads down during the reign of terror, saw that maybe they had an opportunity to, to regain some power here. And so what you get is you get, you get royalist riots breaking out uh, all across France, but particularly in Paris. And the directory, because it was designed to be slow-moving, deliberate, sort of weak, didn't really seem to have a way of dealing with this. And that opened the door for Napoleon Bonaparte. Because Bonaparte had, um, you know, he had, he had entered into the French military uh, at the age of 16. He was a commander of artillery. Uh, he had ascended, of course, at a time of revolution and fighting. You need more more officers. He had ascended to the rank of general by the age of 24. Um, he 
had organized the defense of Toulon against uh, the, mon- the monarchists and had been moved to Paris because monarchist uprisings were happening in Paris. And it was Bonaparte who, with his whiff of grape shot, basically moving his artillery into the public squares, um, dispatched the monarchist uprisings really just, just in a small amount of time. And the directory realized that here was a guy who was decisive, ruthless, um, and, and sort of everything that they were not, that they were not designed to be. So they realized they needed him. So they brought in Napoleon Bonaparte and said, okay, what's the next step? You know, we're, we're being invaded. Um, what's the best way? How do we play defense against the Austrians and Prussians? So it was Bonaparte who said, look, the best way to play defense here is to go on the offense. And what he proposed to do was actually take the southern army uh, the, of, of France, France's national army in the south, and invade northern Italy and seize northern Italy from the Austrian Habsburgs, and essentially forced them to play defense for something that they valued. And in a brilliant campaign in northern Italy, he defeated the the forces of Austria and forced them to sign the Treaty of Campo Formio, in which Austria conceded northern Italy and the Austrian Netherlands to France. Uh, He had accomplished in a matter of a year what, what France's revolutionary armies had not been able to do since the Girondin really assigned them the task. Um, so the, the directory said, that's great, so what's next? And next he proposed to go after the British, not directly but indirectly by going after British possessions in Egypt. Uh, the Egyptian campaign did not go nearly as well for, for Napoleon. Um, he, his, his, navy, uh, his naval assets were destroyed at the Battle of the Nile. He finds his army sort of cut off and lost out in the middle of of the Ottoman Empire, and, and it, it, he eventually had to flee. Uh, he, he left his army behind and headed back to Paris, but he managed to, to tell the story well and, and brought glory upon himself despite the fact that, that he, had, he had left his army high and dry. Um, and he also found by the time he got back to Paris that there was great dissatisfaction with the directory. Uh, in his absence, the Austrians and Russians had retaken most of what he had gained in northern uh, Italy, uh, the economy was a shambles. The directory was clamping down on, on civil liberties again, or not again, but they were doing it. And he found that there were two members of the directory who were um, uh, preparing a, uh, a coup d'etat. They just needed some muscle. They considered themselves to be the, the political minds behind the coup, but they uh, needed some, some military muscle. And they got Napoleon Bonaparte on board thinking he would be the muscle and they would be the brains. And in 1799, they staged a coup d'etat. They overthrew the directory. Bonaparte himself entered into the Chamber of Deputies, which was their, the legislature under the new constitution. He disbanded it. He sent them home. And he promised the French people a new constitution. In the meantime, France would be governed by a consulate, uh, three men, uh, himself and then the other two, the directors, Ducot and Sier, who had joined him in the coup. But when his new um, constitution was written, and he wrote it himself, uh, the two other consuls, the consulate was retained, uh, but the two other consuls found themselves shifted to the, the back bench uh, in, in place of what he referred to as the first consul, which of course was him. And this new constitution was, was brought up before the French people in a plebiscite, seeking their approval, and by an overwhelming margin, the French people approved of this arrangement. It kind of shows you how crazy things had got and how tired the French people were, exhausted really, of the chaos that they'd been dealing with, that they were willing to accept essentially an overthrow of the government that they had been fighting so hard to defend, and its replacement by an an avowed dictatorship really is, is what this consulate was. But Napoleon was a man whom they believed in because he seemed like a guy who could bring stability and order out of chaos and perhaps restore strength and confidence. And um, he immediately went to work making peace with France's enemies, uh, including the Roman Catholic Church. In his Concordat of 1801, uh, he, he brought the Roman Catholic Church back into the life of the French people. Um, he made peace with France, or I mean, with Prussia, Austria, Britain, the Netherlands. And this gave him a chance to kind of um, consolidate his power as first consul with the French people, and his reforms during this time include the establishment of the Code Civil, also known as the Code Napoleon, outside of France, uh, which created a standardized code of laws, which France had not had. France's code of laws was a mess because it went back to the period in which the, um, the nobles were administering the law. 
Um, he established a program of public works to give people jobs and improve conditions in the cities. Um, he uh, created a system of lycée, um, sort of secondary schools, uh, for the training of, of uh, the people essentially your age, to teenagers, and uh, particularly focused on, milita- or on mathematics and science and engineering. So by 1804, Napoleon's reforms uh, had impressed the French people, and um, he sensed that he could now proclaim himself emperor of, of the French which he did, and had himself crowned Emperor of the French at Notre Dame in Paris in 1804. Again, this was made subject to a plebiscite, and the French people gave it their overwhelming support. And now, having established himself at home, Napoleon perhaps began to believe that he was now positioned to go back to war, because Napoleon seemed to have the ambition to to take this, this revolution, maybe he was a Girondin at heart, but to take this revolution and expand it to the rest of Europe, or at least conquer the rest of Europe for France. His first instinct, interestingly, was to invade Great Britain, Um, and he assembled a massive army in preparation for doing so, but just as he had been thwarted in his Egyptian campaign by the British Navy, he'll be thwarted again now at the Battle of Trafalgar, and at the Battle of Trafalgar, uh, the British fleet, led by Lord Horatio Nelson, who also was his, his, the thorn in Napoleon's side in Egypt at the Battle of the Nile, defeated the combined forces of France and Spain. He had made an ally out of Spain. And it basically shut down the opportunity for Napoleon ever to invade Great Britain. He's going to have to come up with some other way to defeat the British. On the other hand, when Napoleon found himself fighting on land, he did much better. And in the same year that he was defeated at sea at Trafalgar, he fought the, the combined forces of Austria and Russia at the Battle of Austerlitz and just crushed them in what was tactically one of the greatest and most celebrated victories in military history. This victory opened the door to, to march on Vienna, and Napoleon quickly um, forced the Austrians to sign a treaty with him. And this treaty ultimately became sort of a template for the treaties that Napoleon signed with other defeated enemies. Uh, The Habsburgs were allowed to remain on the throne in Austria. Napoleon did not want to make permanent enemies out of anybody uh, if he could avoid it, and if he could get them on his side, it would be much more useful than having to constantly worry about uh, rebellions breaking out. Um, But uh, they, they retained their throne if they agreed to allow their armies to be conscripted into the army of France, and if they paid a sort of regular tribute to Napoleon, and if they basically allowed in in France, and if they basically followed French policy on all matters. And that, again, became a template template for treaties that he signed with with other countries. Having defeated the Austrians, Napoleon now uh, declared that the Holy Roman Empire was completely um, eliminated, and instead he entered into a confederation, with many of the the German states that were uh, sort of bordered France. And he referred to this confederation as the Confederation of the Rhine. Now, in doing this, he made an enemy out of Prussia. Prussia had not declared war on France yet. The Austrians and Russians had. But the Prussians certainly were interested in, uh, in who was going to control those German states, and now they declared war. Well, he crushed the Prussians as well. He... he, he headed north into Prussia and defeated the Prussians at the twin battles of Jena and Auerstadt, uh, and then headed east and defeated the Russians at the Battle of Friesenland. And he forced the the Prussians and Russians to sign treaties that were essentially built on the same template of the one that he had signed with the Austrians. And at that point, Napoleon began to consider how to go after the British because it was clear that he could not invade Great Britain. The defeat of his his naval forces by the British had had put that to rest. Napoleon considered, however, that the British economy was entirely based on on commerce. And although he knew that he could he did not have the naval assets to blockade Britain, really, he couldn't really stop goods from flowing into Britain, what he hoped to do was shut off Britain's market. Because if no one was buying British goods, then the British economy would collapse, and, and in a sense, he could, he could defeat them in that way. So he established what became known as the Continental System, and it took the form of two decrees issued in 1807, the Berlin and Milan Decrees. 
And in the Berlin Decrees, he declared that all countries that were aligned with him through a treaty um, must not trade with the British. And in the Milan Decrees, he declared that all neutral countries must not trade with the British. And again, the idea here was not that he expected to choke off Britain's supplies, but that he hoped to ruin their economy by making it impossible for them to sell their products. This is going to be very hard to enforce, and um, and uh, it was it was tough because you know, Britain was the leading manufacturing country of Europe. Many countries, like Russia, which were behind um, economically, relied on British imports, and yet, essentially, at the point at gunpoint, Napoleon required them not to purchase British goods anymore. Um, at first, many people were okay with it. They didn't like the British. The British were unpopular because of their desire to control the seas and, and their sort of monopoly on trade. But there were those who sought to trade with the British, namely Portugal. Portugal is a longtime ally of the British. They continued to trade with them. And Napoleon was sort of outraged that a country as small and weak and insignificant as Portugal would defy him on this. So he decided to invade Portugal and punish them to make a point. And, um, unfortunately, to get to Portugal, he had to march through Spain. Well, that was fine. He had established a treaty with Spain. But as French forces marched across Spain, they came under attack not by the Spanish army, but by the Spanish people. The Spanish people were devoutly Roman Catholic, didn't like, did not like the French army, didn't like the French Revolution, didn't like its anti-Christian uh, policies, despite the fact that Napoleon had, had established the Concordat of 1801. Uh, France was considered almost an atheist country by the Spanish, and they also didn't like the fact that foreign forces were marching on their soil, and so they attacked. They, they waged what became known as guerrilla war, little war, uh, staging small-scale attacks on Napoleon's forces and then sort of disappearing. They were sort of like ambushes, assaults, and then disappear. It was very tough for, for Napoleon's forces. So Napoleon found himself fighting the Spanish guerrillas as well as the, the Portuguese, he told the king of Spain, you've got to get control of this, and, and whether you know, it was because he couldn't or he didn't really want to, it didn't happen, so Napoleon removed the king of Spain and replaced him with his brother Joseph. Well, that was a mistake. He just made an enemy out of... Now, now the Spanish army is out to get him. So it was the, the guerrillas, the Portuguese, and the Spanish army, and it really was a problem for Napoleon's armies. They found themselves bleeding to death. The British were impressed, and they sent uh, Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington, uh, with an army, a British army, and, and they joined in the war. And so now, from 1807 to 1814, at a time when he really can't afford it, Napoleon got himself sucked into a, a war in a theater where he had never intended to fight one. And the Peninsular War drained uh, French military resources at a time when he couldn't really afford it. In the meantime, Napoleon had essentially made every effort to manage his, his empire as best he could. There were essentially three tiers of conquered areas. On the one hand, you had, um, you had territories which had been conquered and absorbed into the French state and incorporated into the French government itself, like the Austrian Netherlands and northern Italy. You had states that had been essentially conquered and, and, and placed under the control of one of Napoleon's relatives. Spain would be an example of that. The, um, the Confederation of the Rhine, another. The Grand Duchy of Warsaw, that would say Poland, uh, another. And then finally, there were those states which remained intact with their traditional leaders in place, Austria, Prussia, Russia, but they were attached by binding treaties to Napoleon. Now, in all of these places, uh, his policies prevailed, and he required all of them to enact the Code Napoleon. But this is how he was trying to manage his, his empire. The thing was that it, di it didn't go well for him. Um, the Code Napoleon, on the one hand, made everybody free under the law, and it essentially banished, it banished serfdom. And so, of course, that ticked off nobles all across Eastern Europe. So the nobles were not for Napoleon. Um, and it also brought the French conceptions of freedom of worship to the rest of Europe, and that ticked off the church. So the two upper estates of Eastern European society, Central European as well, the church and the nobles, were upset with Napoleon. And although uh, peasants maybe should have been quite happy with the Napoleonic Code, it didn't give them anything but their freedom. Um, and instead, French armies in the area typically confiscated their crops and sometimes um, ravaged their territory, so the, the peasants weren't really happy 
with Napoleon either. And since Napoleon was telling them they couldn't trade with the British, which would be normally their best trading partner, the middle class wasn't that happy with them. So really, Napoleon didn't really make anybody happy. Um, and gradually he began to lose sight of what his mission was. At the beginning of, of his career, he was all about spreading the, the revolution and, and eliminating tyranny and spreading the principles of republican government. But by now, he was just a plain old monarch himself. Um, he, had, he had married Marie-Louise Habsburg of Austria so they could produce children, so he could pass down his empire. And, and so the, the reason for fighting of, of French soldiers was now changing. They were fighting essentially for him the way that Austrian or Prussian soldiers had fought for their monarchs, and why bother at that point? And in 1814, then, um, Russia announced that they were no longer going to abide by the continental system, that they were going to start trading with the British. And Napoleon, outraged again, built this monstrous army, 600,000 men, known as the Grand Armée. Only 200,000 of them were French. The rest of them were from countries that they had conquered. And he invaded Russia. The Russians, led by their Tsar Alexander I, um, retreated deep inside Russian territory, destroying everything in their, in their, that, they, that would be left behind. Um, Napoleon would not have crops or shelter uh, his armies, which moved fast by capturing those things instead of carrying them, would be deprived of them. And finally, Napoleon's army, when it reached Moscow, um, found the city had been burned, uh, so that they would not even be able to shelter in the city over the winter. And Napoleon realized he'd been had, and he attempted to retreat. And way out ahead of his army, uh, the way, just in the same way he had abandoned his armies when the Egyptian campaign failed, Napoleon fled back to Paris, leaving his army to trudge back through a bitter winter. And, and the retreat from, from Moscow was devastating. Napoleon lost 95% of his men. Now, many of those may have simply gone home, but, but his army dissipated. He was able to assemble an army among the French, but now with Austria, Prussia, and Russia having rescinded their treaties with him, seeing that he was uh, wounded, uh, they now converged on him. And in one last great battle, the Battle of Leipzig, also known as the Battle of Nations, they defeated Napoleon's army. And in the Treaty of Fontainebleau, Napoleon, um, Fontainebleau, sorry, uh, Napoleon um, abdicated. He was sent to the island of Elba, and there he was held in exile. He was actually uh, designated as the emperor of Elba, and he took that role quite seriously. Uh, and in the meantime, um, Louis XVIII, who was the younger brother of Louis XVI, was installed as the king of France. Napoleon now from Elba began to observe what was going on in France, and, and Louis XVIII was a good boy. He you know, he understood that he was to be a constitutional monarch, and he did a good job of not trying to break the limitations that were supposed to be on him constitutionally. His buddies, on the other hand, a lot of the nobles who had been emigres, who had fled from France, and who now flooded back in, they now took this opportunity to seek revenge on the revolutionary leaders, on the Bonapartist leaders, in what became known as the White Terror. And Louis XVIII, although he perhaps did not order the White Terror, didn't do really much of anything to stop it. And uh, he became quite unpopular. Napoleon was aware of this, sort of guilt by association. Napoleon was aware of this. In the meantime, at Vienna, where um, all of the, the victors, those who had contributed to defeating Napoleon, were meeting in what was known as the Congress of Vienna to sort of reshape Europe following Napoleon's defeat, he noted that they were bickering and that they, they were coming into disagreements over territory and things like that. So finding his enemies disunited and France not happy with the, their new king, Napoleon escaped from Elba and arrived in Marseille in the south of France, and he actually uh, proceeded to Paris, and he ruled France for another hundred days. Uh, Louis XVIII had sent an army after him, but uh, when they encountered Napoleon, he made a great speech and turned them around and got them on his side and marched on Paris, and Louis XVIII had to flee, and, and now Napoleon will rule France for another hundred days. He wanted to try to attack and defeat his enemies as quickly as possible uh, before they could reconvene, and so he marched his army northward into Belgium, fought and defeated the Prussians at the Battle of Ligny, and then went after the British and the Dutch at Waterloo. But the Battle of Waterloo did not go well. Uh, Napoleon found himself heavily engaged with the British, not able to break their infantry squares, 
and late in the afternoon, the, the Prussian cavalry made their way to the battlefield and, and attacked and swept the French forces off the field. Uh, shortly thereafter, Napoleon was forced to hand himself over to the British, and they placed him in exile, this time on the island of St. Helena, out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and he died six years later. So, with Napoleon gone, the rule of France fell to the aforementioned Louis XVIII. He was restored to power after Napoleon was defeated at Waterloo. And he ruled, really, uh, only for about nine years. But as I mentioned, he was, as I, I say, a good boy. He understood that France was to be a, a constitutional monarchy, and he accepted the constitutional limits on his power. When he died in 1824, however, uh, the power, uh, the, the, the throne passed to his younger brother, so Louis XVI's youngest brother now, um, Charles X. And Charles X was, was very much a reactionary. He was very much a, a believer in the principles of absolute monarchy, and, and he, even, he even considered his older brother, Louis XVIII, to be almost like a sort of a traitor to the family and a traitor to the cause for being so willing to accept the throne on a limited basis. Um, it was Charles X who said, I'd rather saw wood for the rest of my life than be a monarch like the King of England, that is, a limited monarch. And so Charles X really was, was probably not the guy who was going to lead France into a more liberal era. He clearly was not. And he almost immediately ran into problems. The Chamber of Deputies which was the, the legislature in this constitutional monarchy, um, really drove him nuts because many of the members of the Chamber of Dep Deputies were taking on these liberal ideas. They were classical liberals, and, and importantly, they were political liberals. They believed in constitutional limits on the power of the government. They believed in civil liberties. They believed in property rights. And every one of those represented a, a limitation on the power of the king, um, Charles X considered these people to be dangerous radicals and their ideas to be radical. And so when he finally concluded that, um, that the chamber was, was too radical, in 1830 he, he disbanded it. Uh, he sent them all home and, and called for new elections. And then what happened was there was protest, and uh, particularly because uh, the, he announced that under the terms of the new elections there would be a much more restricted electorate. It would be there would be he imposed more requirements to vote, and there were Paris erupted in protest, and then he clamped down on the press and clamped down on public assembly and public speaking, and um, in, a, in a series of ordinances, a series of proclamations known as the July Ordinances, issued in July of 1830. Well, that didn't go over well. And it was, again, it was actually the Marquis de Lafayette, who had been the hero of the, a hero of the American Revolution and the French, who, who essentially led the opposition to uh, Charles X. And uh, the, the, the working class of Paris threw barricades across all the streets and announced that they were going to resist. And, um, and uh, Charles X essentially abdicated with almost, uh, he put up almost no fight at all in what became known as the July Revolution. Now, this is the re revolution that um, Les Miserables is based on. And yes, there were conf confrontations between police and uh, uh, sort of uh, police forces and, and some of the barricade uh, defenders. Uh, but there was not a lot of violence in this in this particular revolution. Charles X abdicated. Essentially, um, his only base, his only term for abdication was that his son or his grandson uh, be made king. Well, the the, the revolutionaries sort of reluctantly accepted that uh, that, but in time they offered instead the position of king to his. Uh, to his uh, his uncle uh, Louis Philippe. Uh, Louis Philippe was the uh, the Duke of Orleans, uh, the Duke d'Orléans, and um, was a member of a different branch of the Bourbon family. And Louis Philippe, unlike Charles X, was was quite uh, quite anti-monarchist in some ways. Uh, he had actually fought on the side of the revolutionary government during the the um, the French Revolution against the immigre forces, and uh, for that um, was was forced to flee during the period of the White Terror. Was forced to flee from France, and he uh, 
he sojourned in um, in the United States, and he had actually visited the United States uh, during the Reign of Terror as well, um, and basically found a, a model for governing in George Washington. And um, Louis Philippe did not wish to affect the heirs of a monarch. Uh, he didn't dress like a monarch, didn't wear a crown or carry a scepter or wear royal purple robes. He dressed like a sort of middle-class businessman. And that's he became known as the bourgeois monarch and the citizen king. And he was known for walking from the royal palace in the city to where he worked. Uh, and he would carry an umbrella. And that, that became sort of his symbol, not the scepter, but the umbrella. And in so a lot of in a lot of ways, upon his ascension to the throne in 1830, um, he again he was supposed to be a regent, but instead became king. Um, he was very much celebrated uh, amongst the the liberals and amongst the working class. He was sort of like one of them. But the French nation that he governed was politically quite um, quite divided. Uh, there were those who believed that the best course for France in the future was to restore the monarchy. Uh, these people were known as legitimatists. Um, some of them felt that the Duc d'Orléans, that Louis Philippe had usurped the proper uh, role or had usurped his position, and that the other branch of the Bourbon family ought to be restored. Um, there were Bonapartists who believed that France's best bet was to be ruled as a military dictatorship, as it had been under Napoleon Bonaparte, essentially. You had Republicans who believed in uh, a Republican form of government. Uh, these folks were, were liberals who believed in sort of increasingly constitutional government by a, a representative uh, legislature that was elected by a broad suffrage and that kind of thing. And you began to have socialists. By now, the, the Industrial Revolution that had begun in Great Britain had spread into France, and um, some of the social problems that were associated with industrialization and urbanization were being seen in France, and um, a socialist movement emerged to try to restore the balance and restore some level of equality or, or promote some level of equality within the new industrial and urban society. And despite the fact that he reigned for 18 years, from 1830 until 1848, it was this issue that, that ultimately toppled Louis Philippe because Louis Philippe was a, he was a bourgeois monarch. And what that means is he had embraced the principles of classical liberalism, um, he had embraced the values of the middle class. And although that was a very attractive stance at the beginning, when what they were comparing him to was Charles X, uh, over time, as French society changed, as French society emerged as an industrial and urban society, um, Louis Philippe's classical liberal philosophy held that it was not the job of the government to try to address those problems that were emerging, much in the same way that initially in Britain the sense of many was that it was not the government's job to try to engineer society or try to control the economy or try to produce better social circumstances for the working class. And because his philosophy was this classical liberal philosophy, it prevented Louis Philippe from, from responding to the changes that industrialization and urbanization were bringing about in French society. And, and unfortunately, the more out of tune he seemed to be to that, the more frustrated his people became with him. So that by February of 1848, he was faced with the same level of dissension within the Chamber of Deputies that his predecessor, Charles X, had faced back in 1830. And unfortunately for Louis Philippe, he, he reacted in much the same way. He suspended the chamber, he, he restricted freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, and once again the barricades go up. And in February of 1848, you have another revolution, a third French revolution now. Um, this one saw soldiers fighting in the streets with the, the defenders of the barricades, with the working class of Paris. Um, but after three days of fighting, uh, the working class prevailed, and Louis Philippe was now forced to flee into exile. And at that time, there was a real uh, power vacuum in France. It was not known who then could legitimately rule France. And in light of that power vacuum, um, influence fell to those who were the best organized and who had the clearest idea ideologically 
about what they were about, and that was that were the socialists led by Louis Blanc. And in this atmosphere in which the working class of Paris had sort of won this great victory and had achieved this great revolution, the socialists um, took an opportunity to sort of bring forward their agenda, and Louis Bloch created what were known as national workshops, which were uh, large programs of public works that were designed to enrich the lives of the urban working class, provide them with income, provide them with, with food and shelter, and essentially provide them with a job and, and sort of upgrade the quality of life in the cities. The problem with these national workshops was how they were to be paid for. And he proposed to pay for them through an increase in land taxes. And that really turned, uh, turned off a lot of uh, working class agricultural workers. So uh, peasants, if you want to call them that, small scale farmers, um, by taxing their land in order to subsidize these national workshops, Louis Blanc really, really turned them against his program. Why should we pay for a program that benefits urban workers uh, was the perspective of the agricultural working class, and it divided French society. And, and um, so when it came time to create a new constitution uh, after the revolution of 1848, and elections were held throughout France uh, to determine who, who would be the delegates to create this new constitution, um, the delegates who were elected were largely conservative. Very few socialists were elected. And that outraged the working class in Paris, and guess what? Up went the barricades again. And, you know, the first time the barricades went up in 1830, the working class prevailed with essentially no resistance. And then the second time it went up in February, the working class again prevailed, uh, despite some resistance from the army. But this time... They did not prevail uh, in what was known as the bloody June days of June 1848. Um, this time the army moved in and representing a, a French nation that really did not support. The French nation supported the toppling of Louis the, um, of Louis the, the Louis Philippe. Uh, but the French nation did not support the preservation of Louis Blanc and the socialists and the national workshops and the tax scheme that went with them. And so this time the working class was overthrown and badly defeated. And as they tried to, to build a new constitution, uh, the French people settled on a republic known as the Second French Republic. The Second French Republic, established in 1848, was a, a parliamentary presidential republic. There would be a, um, an elected parliament. Um, there would be an elected parliament. This would be the representative. They would, they would carry the legislative authority. But then separately from them, the French people would elect a president. Uh, so this is sort of based on the American model. Uh, and the, this president would, would be the chief executive and head of state. When it came time to elect a chief executive, the French people elected Louis-Napoleon Bonaparte, who was the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, the great emperor and, and conqueror. Um, upon what basis did they choose him? Largely name recognition, um, and also perhaps a sense that his uncle had brought order out of chaos back in 1799, 1800, 1804, and perhaps um, that's what they wanted at this time. It seemed like there had once again been chaos. You'd had many transitions in government. You'd had two revolutions in 20 years. And um, maybe they believed that, that this Napoleon could, could bring about that stability that his uncle had. Perhaps they believed that this Napoleon could establish France uh, as, a, as a glorious, powerful nation the way his uncle had. Either way, they elected him. And he actually did quite well. He did a good job of, of balancing the interests of the working class and the, the, the middle class. Um, he accepted and promoted reforms uh, that would uh, address some of the problems of the industrial urban society. He adopted a lot of the same reforms that the British had adopted. Um, and yet, at the same time, he also, um, he also and, and basically, whenever anybody opposed him, he threatened that, that, essentially, he argued that you're not doing the people's work. Um, and then, on the other hand, he also... Um, 
He also promoted business through the development of a sort of national bank a model on the same model as Alexander Hamilton's National Bank in the United States. So he promoted the interests of big business like a, uh, like a promoter of business should, but he also addressed the needs of the working class. Uh, and he was therefore uh, quite popular, and four years after being elected president, he declared himself emperor and suspended the constitution and declared the second French empire, uh, renamed himself Napoleon III, and, and had himself crowned as emperor, just as his uncle had done. He then set about to demonstrate to the world that France was important and that France could operate sort of outside the box that had been created for them at the Congress of Vienna. After the first Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, well, at, at, you know, at the Battle of Nations and then at Waterloo, the mission of so many of the other uh, states of Europe was to box France in. Uh, Clemens von Metternich of Austria had said that when Paris sneezes, all of Europe catches cold. So one of the missions uh, of the monarchs at the Congress of Vienna was to sort of build a wall of strong states around France and box France, box France in. Napoleon III was determined to show that France could be influential outside that box. So, for example, shortly after declaring himself emperor, he, he persuaded the sultan of the Ottoman Empire to choose France as the protector of Christians within the empire. Now, that was a role that had been traditionally held by the Russians, um, because most of the Christians in the Ottoman Empire were Orthodox. But as a result of his negotiations with, with Napoleon III, the sultan shifted that title to France. Um, the Russians, who were looking for a reason to fight the Ottoman Empire anyway, um, uh, because they were hoping to gain control of the straits that would give them access to the Black Sea, they declared war in and, and France and the Ottoman Empire, and then they got Britain on their side, um, and Sardinia, they fought what was known as the Crimean War a war from 1853 to 56 over the control of the Black Sea region. And the French, with their British and Sardinian and Ottoman allies, defeated the Russians. Um, and the French also at this time got involved in Italian unification. Napoleon III established an alliance with Sardinia following their work together in the Crimean War. He assisted the Sardinians in defeating the Austrians in northern Italy, helped drive them out of Lombardy. And, and then um, he took an interest in Napoleon III in um, some of the German states. Now, this is where he, he went wrong, because um, he got involved with Otto von Bismarck. And Otto von Bismarck of Prussia was looking to establish a German state, and he had his eyes on Alsace and Lorraine which were regions of France which were ethnically divided, roughly equally, between ethnic French and ethnic Germans. And what happened was um, Napoleon III allowed himself to get manipulated by Otto von Bismarck. First of all, um, Otto von Bismarck secured a non-aggression pact with Napoleon III so that when uh, Prussia fought its war against Austria... Uh, for control of the German Confederation, uh, France did not intervene. And in return for that, uh, that non-aggression pact, Otto von Bismarck essentially promised um, dominance over the southern German states, which were Catholic, um, to Napoleon III. Napoleon III was thrilled with this. But then Bismarck essentially double-crossed him and instead offered Prussian protection to those southern Catholic states and when they sensed that Napoleon III was the real enemy, uh, they, gave their, they gave their loyalty to Prussia. This sort of outraged Napoleon III, and in a series of dispatches back and forth between Napoleon III and Kaiser, well, not Kaiser yet, but uh, Wilhelm I, the king of Prussia, um, he was attempting to, to sort of bypass Bismarck. Bismarck, however, would not be bypassed. And he issued what became known as the Ems Dispatch, which was a dispatch from Wilhelm I, King of Prussia, back to Napoleon III. And Bismarck sort of edited it in such a way that it sounded hostile and insulting. And Bismarck distributed it not only to Napoleon III, but also to all of the French press. And immediately there was outrage against Prussia. It seemed as though Prussia had insulted France and uh, Wilhelm had insulted their emperor. emperor. And so there was this, this great outcry for war. And 
This uh, led to the declaration of war in 1870, uh, and what we have is the Franco-Prussian War. Well, the French were not prepared to fight this war. Uh, the Prussians very much were. It had been a war that, that Bismarck had been planning on fighting, and so the, the results were, were devastating for the French. They were crushed at the Battle of Sedan, uh, and Napoleon III himself was carried off in chains, a prisoner of Otto von Bismarck. And in the absence of the emperor, who had ruled as emperor by then for 18 years, uh, there was another attempt made by the working class of Paris to seize control of the state. This is known as the Paris Commune. Uh, and once again, up go the barricades in 1871. Uh, but once again, the, the working class of Paris, uh, this time, as, they, as in the June days, the bloody June days of 1848, the working class of Paris does not represent the will of the French nation as a whole. And so they're defeated and crushed, and 10,000 of them are killed, and, and uh, the barricades are defeated. So the, the barricades, the working class of Paris went two and two with their barricades. They succeeded in overthrowing Charles X in 1830, Louis Philippe in 1848, but then they were crushed by the army with bloody losses in June of 1848, and then with the Paris Commune in 1871. So France was then, a, a new constitution then was established, and France was declared again a republic, France's third republic, uh, for those of you trying to keep track. It was the most inoffensive of options. Um, you still had legitimatists who wanted to restore the monarchy. You still had Bonapartists who believed that despite, despite Napoleon III's failures, that, that dictatorship was the best way to go. You still had socialists, although they got crushed in the commune, and you still had republicans. But the one thing that everybody agreed upon was that at least in a republic, everybody got their chance to win. And so it was the least offensive option. But interestingly, despite essentially being a punt, um, the French Third Republic lasted. Uh, it lasted from 1871 all the way until 1940 when France was overrun by the Germans. So it was the most stable French government that we've seen since the monarchy. Their greatest crisis came in 1894 with the Dreyfus Affair, but in some ways that crisis proved to strengthen the Republic. What had happened was Alfred Dreyfus, who was a French army officer, was accused of essentially giving away military secrets to the Germans. And, um, and what happened was, uh, he was he was stripped of his, his rank and discharged from the army and imprisoned. Um, and then evidence emerged that, that he ha had been wrongly convicted. The army bunglingly tried to, uh, to cover up this evidence. And, and the, co the, the cover-up unraveled. And it was unraveled by a French author, Emile Zola, Z-O-L-A, in, in an article published that was called J'accuse, I Accuse, in which he basically laid out the whole case for how the army had bungled the whole thing, had convicted the wrong person, and then had covered, once they knew that they had done so, they had covered it up. And it led to a massive scandal in the government. Um, adding to this was the fact that Dreyfus was Jewish. And uh, the, 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 the battle lines within France came down to this. You're legitimists and you're Bonapartists and you're traditionalists. The people who believed in strong authoritarian government supported the army against Dreyfus, the Republicans, and the, the Socialists supported Dreyfus. And really, the, the whole thing became very ugly. And, and on the side of the legitimatist, the legitimist Bonapartist traditionalists, on the side of those who favored authoritarian government, a lot of their arguments became anti-Semitic tirades. Well, particularly as the process continued, as it became more and more clear that the army had massively screwed this up. Those legitimatists and Bonapartists looked stupider and stupider. Um, and they looked more and more wrong. And they really lost credibility with the, the French public. And so it's interesting to note that although this crisis was very rough um, and, and really divided French society into these two camps, as a result of the crisis... Two of those camps, the legitimists and the Bonapartists, were so fully discredited that they ceased to be um, major players in French politics, which now opened the door for a stable French republic that was sort of center-left, 
you know, Republicans, liberal Republicans, uh, it seems a strange phrase, but, but Republicans who embraced the ideas of classical liberalism on one hand, socialists on the other hand, and you have this sort of balance of power between them now through the French defeat in 1940. And so that's part of the reason why this government was so stable. They went through this tough crisis, this t- tough scandal, but they became stable out of it. In the meantime, they began to build empire. The French jumped into the imperialist uh, uh, race. Um, the French uh, at this time established large imperial holdings in the western part of Africa, so sort of Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco. Um, the French, as a matter of fact, had ambitions to expand their imperial holdings moving west to east. Um, there was a, a brief moment in 1898 where it looks like the French ambitions to go west to east across North Africa were going to lead to war with the British, as if they needed a reason to make war with the British uh, ever before. And this led to something called the Fashoda Crisis, a sort of a staring down in what is today's Sudan between the British and French. Eventually, the, the French backed down. But this is also the era, the late 19th century, when the French began to build an empire in Southeast Asia. And it's, it is when French Indochina was established, and the French, uh, actually, the earliest French presence in Indochina began during the reign of Napoleon III, and it continued to grow through the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Um, French Indochina continued to be French until it was stripped from them again in 1940 by the advancing Japanese. Uh, but then after World War II, it became uh, a a colonial possession of the French again, but not for long. This is what resulted then in the French-Indochina War, which evolved into the Vietnam War. So that brings us up almost to 1914 and the outbreak of World War I. Um, The French helped to form the Triple Entente. Uh, The French and the Russians established the Triple Entente, along with Great Britain, in response to some of the moves of Germany. Now, Uh, As a result of the Franco-Prussian War, Germany had seized Alsace-Lorraine from France. In doing so, had made an irreconcilable enemy of France. France was determined to overturn the results of the Franco-Prussian War. So they were irreconcilable. Naturally, they were going to be against Germany. And they found willing allies in the Russians, who were outraged by German support for the Young Turks and the Ottoman Empire, and the French also found support from the British, who were outraged by Kaiser Wilhelm II's attempt to build up his fleet. And so that brings us up to the outbreak of World War I in 1914. And that's where we'll end this review session.